would first like to thank the organizers for this wonderful uh, conference. It's the first time I'm here. So um, before I say anything about math, everything I will talk about is a joint work with uh, Juhi Jang, who is uh, based at uh, University of Southern California and this, this year at the uh, IAS. So uh, uh, the good thing about this long title th is that it basically tells you the statement of the main theorem. There are certain special solutions to the system of PDEs I will look at. Um, Euler Poisson system, it comes from astrophysics, it's a model of a star, and we will be studying the nonlinear stability of that class of solutions. So uh, let me give you an outline. Well, first, I, I, s I intend to spend quite a bit of time introducing the, the system and talking about general properties. Uh, perhaps at the expense of giving you some technical details in the, in the second half of the talk. Um, <coughs> but I can promise that there will be two different stability results pertaining to two different types of special solutions that we will look at. And uh, uh, one of them, the first one is easier. This is the one where I, c I will probably uh, give you a pretty complete idea how the proof works. And hopefully there will be time to talk about the second second type of expansion. So, before any of that, let me just tell you that the gravitational Euler Poisson system is the model you would find in a typical astrophysics book describing a star. So, uh, it is a Newtonian model. Uh, the idea is that uh, the star is a gas or a fluid kept together by gravitational forces. So, uh, let me tell you what this talk is not about. It's not about relativistic models of stars, but nevertheless part of the motivation for studying this model indeed comes from uh, relativity. And I will mention that hopefully at the end of the talk. Um, so as I said, the star is idealized as a compact fluid body. And the word compact is, is crucial because it suggests that there is a boundary between the fluid and the vacuum. And if you want to model such a, such a problem, and if you want to track the behavior of the boundary, you have to allow for that boundary to move. So this, causes, this gives us uh, a moving star, star vacuum interface. So what is the model? Well, first I'll tell you the unknowns. The first three are unsurprising, and you're used to them. The fluid density rho and the pressure p, the velocity field u, and the gravitational field phi that you need to couple to the Euler equations. The fourth unknown, or the, the further unknown, is the support of the fluid because we are trying to treat a free boundary problem. Okay? And the equations, again, you have, uh, you have seen uh, some fluid models uh, this time around. Don't be scared. We will, uh, we will soon, uh, we will soon um, forget about this slide. The first equation is the continuity equation. The second one is, expresses the conservation of momentum. And on the right hand side, you will see the, a term caused by the, by the gravitational field phi. And the gravitational field phi is self-consistent. It's uh, generated by the, by the mass density here. So, so Laplace phi is 4 pi rho. This is the Poisson equation. And these are the equations of compressible fluid dynamics. On top of that, we have to supply this problem with some boundary conditions. And remember, this boundary is moving. So the kinematic boundary condition is the, is the, is the natural statement that the, f the boundary is moved by the fluid particles. So the normal velocity of the boundary is, in fact, the normal component of the velocity field at the, at the free boundary. And the pressure vanishes at the boundary. Okay. Now, you, if you count the unknowns, you will notice that there is one superfluous unknown here, namely the pressure. There is no evolution equation for pressure, and you need to prescribe a further equation to, uh, or a relation to actually close this system. There is one equation for rho, three for u, one for phi, but there is nothing for pressure. And this is typically done by prescribing the so-called equation of state. Now, equation of state, equations of state are some, is something that in, in, in the physics literature you would sort of, uh, you would look at a particular model of a star and you would hope to have a good understanding of what the equation of state is for that particular star. What is commonly done, people study the so-called polytropic uh, equation of state where P of rho is rho to a certain power gamma. 
And this gamma is the so-called adiabat adiabatic index, and it's allowed to vary between 1 and 2. So the way I sort of would like you to think about this model, I would like you to think of this nonlinear problem as parameterized by gamma. Okay? And uh, as we vary gamma, the properties, the, the qualitative properties of the solutions of this the system will change. Okay, so let me comment a little bit on the, on the literature. Uh, the, the vacuum interface itself is uh, known to cause uh, severe analytical difficulties in, in proving local, uh, even local well positiveness. So the basic, basic result in, this, in the theory of compressible fluids with vacuum interfaces are basically these two results. They, arrived, they came independently in 2010 by Couton and Scholar and Jang and Masmoudi. And so what, the, what they have to contend with is a certain degeneracy. I will explain it as we go through the talk that is caused by the presence of the vacuum. But one of the key insights is the use of the Lagrangian coordinates. So if you use Lagrangian coordinates and if you rephrase the compressible Euler equations surrounded by vacuum, you will discover uh, that there is a wave equation, a quasi-linear wave equation lurking in the background. Okay, so that's somehow the the, the, the uh, one of the big uh, revelations. It is a degenerate wave equation, degenerate in the sense that I will specify uh, uh, later, but it, this, the word degenerate has to do with the fact that some of the coefficients of the wave <laughs> equation will vanish at, at uh, the, the vacuum boundary. And another key assumption, so another key assumption in, in, uh, in these works <coughs> is that of a physical vacuum boundary condition. So uh, here I'm stating what it is. It's a statement that the fluid enthalpy, which is this quantity, rho to the power gamma minus one, uh, has to have its normal derivative at the vacuum boundary has to have a sign. This is perhaps not uh, a well-motivated uh, uh, condition. Uh, so physically it, it expresses the fact that, that particles have to accelerate uh, uh, accelerate in the normal direction at the boundary, but uh, I, I will soon actually <coughs> um, motivate this, sorry, I will soon motivate this condition by uh, uh, finding particular steady state solutions of the Euler Poisson system that satisfy this. And indeed, if you open an astrophysics textbook, this, the, the star models, the steady state star models that they look at, all satisfy this type of condition, the compactly supported ones. Uh, Okay, so these, so there is a little bit of a discrepancy here. Here I'm citing works that pertain to a uh, compressible Euler equation. You could ask me, uh, what about Euler Poisson? Because I'm adding a gravitational field. From the point of view of well positiveness theory, this is a lower order perturbation. So if you understand how to, how to prove well positiveness here, you will understand how to prove well positiveness for Euler Poisson system. But uh, nevertheless, I sh there is a reference that I'm missing. Where is the the chalk. Yeah. Oh, fantastic, thank you. So, um, so prior to this work, there's uh, one result which deals only with a priori estimates, where uh, with Lindblad, Couton, Lindblad, and Scholar. So this is one, one name missing. So on a priori bounds, Couton, Lindblad, Scholar, and for the Euler Poisson system, this came much later, uh, entirely based on, uh, based on 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 these ideas. There's a work of Luo, Shin, and Zhang. Okay, this is for it. No, not for the vacuum interface. So for the, for the liquid case, when the density is not vanishing at the boundary, so this is a significantly less degenerate model. Okay, so instead of, I, I will now try to give you, um, to do three things for you. I will give you an example of the, this famous class of steady states known as lane and stars. Then I will, uh, I will uh, I'm expecting a sigh of relief I will uh, pr produce an invariant scale, rescaling for this problem and uh, explain a certain um, 
uh, notion of criticality that enters, and uh, that will motivate the, the main, main results. So most famous class of special solutions are the steady states. And the way you produce them, you set rho to be only a function of x and u to be 0. So you plug it in, and the whole equation reduces to this statement here, gradient of rho star gamma plus rho star gradient phi star equals 0. So if you use the fact that this satisfies the Poisson equation, and if you call this object here, this is the fluid enthalpy, if you call it w, then in spherical symmetry, and this is a very classical stuff, you will see this in astrophysics textbooks, uh, you reduce the problem to solving this ordinary differential equation. Okay. And the key question is, for what powers of gamma can I find a compactly supported solution with finite mass? This is your star. So the answer is, if gamma lies in this magical range, then you can find profiles that are indeed compactly supported, <coughs> say with support 0, 1, and they look exactly like that. Once gamma hits 6 fifths and below, uh, no such solutions exist. It's just the ODE analysis. And moreover, these special solutions in fact satisfy the physical vacuum condition. So W prime at 1 is strictly less than 0. Okay, so the, w, the, the, the density profile is not smooth across the, across the vacuum interface. And, and this is uh, one of the critical points that um, works of Couton, Scholar, Jang, and Masmoudi had to address. The fact that you, the non-smoothness is a generic part of the theory. So you have to find a way, what, it even, what does it even mean to differentiate the equation in a proper sense. You can ask, however, and this is what physicists did, are these solutions stable? So now the numerology gets even more interesting. If gamma lies in this range here, the lane Emden stars are linearly unstable. And if gamma, sorry, this is wrong. And if gamma is bigger, equal than 4 thirds, it's in fact uh, linearly stable. So it's just some basic uh, linear analysis. Um, of course, it begs a question about, uh, well, two questions. Are these results, uh, can they be upgraded to a nonlinear statement? So the first result can. It is not terribly surprising. Once you have a, a growing mode, which is indeed the, the main source of instability in this regime, and once you have a good well posedness theory, then you can prove nonlinear instability. And this was shown by Jang in 2014. Uh, nonlinear stability is a much, much more contentious point. So there is a, there is a conditional nonlinear stability result in a very, uh, sort of a fairly weak topology generated by, the, by uh, basically just the energy by Ryan from 2003, which says if the solution exists, it will be uh, nonlinearly stable. However, there is absolutely no reason why the solution should exist. Why should small perturbations of, of these steady states should... And it's in the same regime, 4 thirds to 2? Pardon? For the result of Ryan is in, in, in that regime? Uh, right, so the result of Ryan, uh, the topology is so weak that it doesn't really see the, the, free, uh, the, uh, the free boundary. In particular, this type of stability uh, result, if it were to hold, if you think about it, will actually allow you to um, have s support splitting up and things like that. It, the topology will not see it. So it's really, you really need uh, something else. And in fact, I will talk about it at the very end. I will, I will uh, highlight this as one of the important open problems in this, in this uh, th development. Okay, so let me try to sh perhaps explain these exponents that show up in a different way. And this hopefully will, uh, will uh, help you appreciate them. There is an invariant rescaling of this problem. To each gamma, to each gamma, you can associate the f this invariant rescaling, where you see, uh, where uh, you just work it out, and you realize that if rho and u are solutions, then rho tilde and u tilde are also solutions. 
And the way you rescale the time depends on gamma. So really, the value of gamma uh, has a lot to say about the structure of the solutions of the equation. In particular, the pressure and the potential, you can work it out from these how to rescale. Okay? The second ingredient that I'm sure you will appreciate, what are the conserved quantities? Well, the mass, this is easy, the integral of the density, and the total energy. Let's just briefly talk about the total energy. This bit here is the kinetic energy. This object here, remember, rho is Laplace phi. So if you integrate by parts, this becomes negative gradient phi squared. So this is just the, the gravitational energy, which gives a negative contribution. And this thing here, uh, rho to the power gamma, is some sort of thermal, uh, thermal energy of the star. OK, and the, the, the question that is quite natural in, in this context is, what is the behavior under the rescaling? And then you discover that the mass remains invariant in exactly when gamma equals 4 thirds, mm -hmm. and energy remains invariant exactly when gamma equals 6 fifths. And these are the two numbers that are popped up here. Okay. So this is to suggest that uh, these numbers, these, this numerology has a, a special meaning. All of the results for the remainder of the article of this <laughs> presentation <laughs> will pertain to the mass critical case gamma equal four thirds. I said article because the, the actual article is supposed to appear tomorrow on the, on the preprint server, on the archive, and, uh, and uh, there are several spots where we, we, tr we, we said and erased all the results for the remaining of the, uh, remainder of this article pertain to this case. Anyway, but okay, this is, the, this is the key point to remember. So gamma equal four thirds is the mass critical case. I'll tell you why physicists li like this, this particular uh, value of gamma. You see, it's a rescaling that keeps the, the mass preserved. So it's a very appealing to think of gravitational collapse or expansion as somehow some process that sort of cascades through these uh, scales, lambda, but it preserves the mass. It's very natural. So the, the, the beautiful thing about this is that, in fact, there is a result of Goldreich and Weber, who were physicists in 1980, where they, construct, they found explicit examples of collapsing and expanding solutions, uh, of examples of stars, in this mass-critical case. And, uh, uh, now let me do some, some um, computation. So if gamma equals 4 thirds, and if my self-similar rescaling is this, so you can work out what this coefficient is here. So 2 minus 4 thirds is 2 thirds. 1 over that is 3 halves. So this, is, so this becomes p over lambda to the power 3 halves. OK. OK. So to have a self-similar collapse or a self-similar rescaling would correspond to having a collapsing solution that scales like, like uh, the, uh, whose radius scales like t minus t to the power 2 thirds, or an expanding solution that, that, that expands at the same rate. This would be the, the corresponding coefficient if you had if you wanted to call this a self-similar collapse. However, uh, if you follow through the paper of Goldreich and Weber, already implicitly there, and then explicitly in the works, works of Makino and Lin, you will find a second family of expanding and collapsing solutions that decay, that expand and collapse at a linear rate. Okay. And this is sort of a, this was part of the, the mystery for us to understand <laughs> First of all, the, 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 the reasons why this is so. Yes? I'm sorry. Which one corresponds to the explicit solution? Uh, I'm sorry. This one. This, one. I did, this is not explicit. This is just, you see, I'm, I'm putting this sign here. I will, so this is informal. In a few slides, I will give you the exact uh, formula. Uh, there is a correction term. Uh, the, uh, for this guy, there is no correction term. This is perfect. This is, this is corrected. By your uh, No, 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 no. It's just, it's just something linear. You will okay. see. You will see. No, no, no logs. I, I, well, we'll come to that at the end of the talk as well. So, sorry, so there are two families of stuff? There, there are two families. No, 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 no. When I say self-similar, I mean this. There is, but there are two families of collapsing and expanding solutions. This, so it, it, 
I, for whatever reasons, they, in these works, you will never read this off. They will never talk about the rates. They sort of, they analyze this and they say there exist these solutions. But if you really look at the rates, uh, this is what will happen. I will, give, I will give a more precise statement later on. So this is an informal statement, okay, informal statement. So don't ask me for any, any norms and, uh, and so on at this moment. Uh, this will also come later. The basic result is that these self-similar expanding, prof expanding profiles, so I'm not talking about collapse, the ones that behave at this uh, like two to the power two thirds are co-dimension one stable. And the linearly expanding guys will be just stable. In this case, we can actually talk about asymptotic stability in this co-dimension one uh, uh, set of perturbations, whereas here uh, we, don't, we do not uh, uh, characterize the asymptotic attractors. There are just some objects that do not necessarily belong to uh, some sort of nearby linearly expanding profile. Okay, this is, the, these are the, this is the gist of the results. I will get into the technical statement slightly later. In particular, these are, to my knowledge at least, first non-trivial examples of global solutions for this free boundary problem. And what is very important for us, we can actually say, we can actually say that the support of the, of the star, of the nearby perturbed star, actually grows uh, at uh, approximately the same rate as the underlying background solution. Okay. So um, now let me, let me take you back to uh, what ideas go into the well-posedness theory, and this will bring us then, then to, the, to the proofs of these results. Uh, as I mentioned, fundamental idea in this, uh, in this work is to use uh, the Lagrangian coordinates. Okay, so you've seen them. Eta dot, it's, okay, eta is simply the, the flow of particle trajectories. And because, because I will, I will now make an assumption of spherical symmetry. It is actually not fundamental to uh, this, these results, but I want to make it because it will display uh, in a very concise way the fundamental structure that, that we need to worry about. Okay, so assume everything is spherically symmetric. <laughs> now, the, the, I, 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 maybe it's slightly uh, pompous to say structural miracle, but it is a beautiful structure of these equations. If you, if you use Lagrangian coordinates, in spherical uh, symmetry, you discover that <laughs> chi, which is now my Lagrangian map, satisfies a second order equation, chi tt plus fw of chi equals zero, where this fw is some nonlinear operator which is of second order. Okay? And this is an effective quasi linear wave equation on a compact domain. Okay. Now, you, there's this thing here, I don't want to display FW because it's not beautiful, but I will tell you later how it linearizes and you will be convinced that it is, it is a, a, a second order, it's a second order adjoint, uh, a self-adjoint operator in a certain is, space. Is this uh, an artifact of the fact that this would be rotational? Uh, correct, okay. absolutely, yeah. So, so I can, um, so okay, so now that you raise this question. So if it were not uh, spherically symmetric or irrotational, if it were uh, pure if it were the full system. Um, the, the, ma the flow map eta would satis satisfy an effective wave map type equation. The divergence of the flow map, which roughly corresponds, which captures the irrotational part, would satisfy an, e an equation like this. So divergence of the Jacob uh, divergence of the of the uh, of eta t of the velocity vector field. Whereas the curl would satisfy a uh, um, um, because, okay, so let me explain this. Because, remember, uh, in the Lagrangian coordinates, rho, d, uh, rho dt u, where u is now pulled back with respect to the, t is my, my Lagrangian time and u is my Lagrangian velocity, plus the, the, the pullback of the pressure would be something. And your curl of this guy vanishes. So this would give you, uh, a, a, if you wish, a transport equation for curl, and the free uh, sort of estimates of curl of u for free. So the idea is that when you deal with the full problem, you estimate the divergence and the curl in two separate ways. Okay. So you have a, you, you, but it can be calculated. Absolutely, okay. yeah. So this is, in some sense, at the heart of the approach of uh, Couton, Scholar, uh, Jang, and Nasmoudi. The framework, the functional framework is slightly different, but this is the 
the main idea. Okay, so there is a there is a, a wave equation. That's what that's my point, and it's it's posed on a compact domain because you pulled it back onto the in, 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 to fix the the free boundary. You had to pull it back onto something fixed. So it's a wave equation on a compact domain. So let me now re-derive derive really those uh, those solutions of Goldreich and Weber and other people. I will call them homogeneous solutions because I will make the ansatz that chi is just lambda of t, doesn't depend on r. Now this will, this will tell you, uh, this, this ansatz will reduce the previous equation to, to this uh, thing here, lambda square lambda double dot plus something which doesn't depend on t equals zero. So you can separate variables and if you do that, you discover that there is an ODE satisfied by lambda and there is another ODE in R, this time satisfied by W. You are interested in finding compactly supported solutions because that's what qualifies as a, as, a, as, a, as a star with a vacuum interface, and you can do that. There is a magical value of delta star such that for any delta bigger than del delta star, you can find compactly supported solutions to this equation, and this is just an ODE. You can really, for, ver for a range of values of delta, and initial conditions, you can really classify and see what are the rates of collapse or expansion and so on. So I will do that for you in a second. As I said, you can solve this ODE, pres prescribe the initial conditions. There are three parameters in the problem, the delta that I mentioned, lambda 1, initial velocity, and lambda 0, the initial radius of the star. Um, there is a conserved energy associated with this ODE. It's trivial. It's it's this quantity here, lambda dot squared plus 2 delta over lambda. In the Eulerian description, so you can always go back and recover the original solution in the Eulerian description, the density and the velocity will look like this. Okay, so the key point, the density is like lambda to the minus 3. So if lambda is shrinking, density is blowing up. If lambda is expanding, the density, the, the fluid wants to tear itself apart. It's, it's, it's decaying. And remember, as I mentioned, self-similarity would correspond to these, these, these numbers here, two-thirds. So it turns out that self-similar solutions exist, but only when the energy is zero. If energy is not zero, they're not going to obey the two-third law. And instead of sort of solving the ODE, I, 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 I also could not resist uh, not putting this on the, on the slides. Uh, this is a, a, a kind of a bifurcation diagram that explains what's going on. So this is a delta, delta, a delta axis. This is the, the lambda 1 axis. And I'm fixing uh, initial, initial radius to be exactly 1. Okay. So what you see here, the light blue region, this is the range of parameters that will give you always a linearly expanding profile. So a profile that behaves asymptotically like some constant times t. These guys here, the, the thick blue line, this is exactly the self-similar expansion. And there is an explicit formula that I will give you for them on the next slide. So, but they, you have to insist that e, the energy is zero. So they're obviously unstable, because if you can go e either way from the surface, the question is, if you look at perturbations of energy zero, are they going to remain uh, stable? And then you have the collapsing uh, so, mo as you can see, most of the collapsing solutions in this range here are, uh, are, um, have, uh, self exhibit self-similar collapse. And then there is, a, there is this uh, lower, lower, uh, lower dimensional ob uh, line where the, co uh, the collapse is in fact uh, at happens at a linear rate. So this is the structure of this, of this space in this two-dimensional two parameter space. Okay, and the basically the basic results is are uh, this light blue region is stable, and this uh, this thick blue region is um, co-dimension one stable. Okay, so this line for this line you have an explicit formula which is just the statement that E equals zero. Do you have a question? Uh, and below also. Ah, you mean here? Yes. Uh, I well. Uh, I can tell you a very weak statement. I can prove that th these are non-linearly stable in this, in this self-similar frame, but this is not a, a, a good statement. You really need to 
uh, I don't know whether, so for instance, I don't know if you perturb uh, an element here, whether it will collapse. Okay, so this is an open problem. I will state it at the end as well. Is a <coughs> linear rate of expansion the physical one, the one that astrophysics is interesting? So Goldreich and Weber completely discarded this for whatever reason. And they, they, were, uh, uh, they were interested in, colla in, in collapse and expansion at self-similar rate. Uh, if you look at uh, other physics literature, they actually mostly don't want to deal with the, with the free boundary. They are uh, aware of the difficulties that come with that. So in their, in their literature, they think of Goldreich and Weber as the only example where you have a sharp boundary. In most cases, they are worried about constructing some type of solution that exhibits either uh, collapse or supernova, or the expansion, uh, where you have infinite support, but the decay, some sort of decay at infinity. This would be, for them, uh, good enough. Okay? And this, uh, this, is, this also leads to good problems, because most of it is also not rigorous. So, part two, how to study the stability of the expanding guys. This is the formula that uh, Frank, I believe, asked me about. This is the explicit formula for, uh, for self-similar expansion, whereas you don't, you don't have explicit formulas for the linear expansion. They are sort of approximate, but they are to the leading order just this. So I will, from now on, focus only on the expanding profiles and perhaps pompously call it supernova, but let's just say expansion. And I want you to recall that they satisfy a wave equation of this type, and Fw is some second order operator. Now how to study this object? Well, you adapt your unknown to what you believe to be stable by, name, by, uh, by dividing by it. Basically, you define psi to be chi he divided by <laughs> lambda bar, okay? And then you expect psi to be a, a, a small perturbation of one, which happens to be a steady state of this equation in this case. So if you make this ansatz and plug it back in here, you get this equation, second order uh, PDE. Now, uh, how to deal with this? Well, self-similar expansion uh, really uh, behaves well with respect to the scaling invariances of the problem. So the natural thing to do is to rescale time with respect to the uh, corresponding, uh, corresponding uh, self-similar rescaling. As you will see, the linear expansion doesn't sort of, the, the, prob the equations don't digest it very well. So uh, it will cause uh, uh, certain difficulties that will not be present in the self-similar case. Okay, so let's move on to the, dis are, are there any questions about this? So is, is, it, is, it, is it absolutely clear what's going on? I okay. So let me, let me, tell you the basic structure that will allow you to, to um, understand the stability. So let's now focus purely on the self-similar profiles. So remember, let me write that down. Self-similar profile is something that expands like t to the two-thirds. So this is the radius of the, of the star. Okay, C is a steady state of the equation on this slide. So I will write C as one plus a perturbation. C equal one is a steady state. You do that, you demand that the initial energy is zero, that the energy of perturbation is zero, energy is conserved, so this is a, a conserved quantity. And of course the key idea, as I mentioned, is to pass to the self-similar time if you do that, so this roughly means that, you, that uh, the new time beha behaves like log t, okay, because lambda expands like two-thirds. If you do that, you discover that this coefficient here is constant. I call it b to uh, honor uh, some of the notation that's, that's popular in the, in the literature. Uh, this quantity is a constant which is strictly less than zero. What about the nonlinearity? So you expand the nonlinearity around, uh, around one, Okay, and you discover, and this is now uh, the point that will perhaps uh, clarify one of the questions, you discover that in the, the linearization of this, of this uh, operator is precisely this second order elliptic operator here, but now I want you to stare at it for a second. Notice that uh, when, when r is zero, this term vanishes, and when uh, r is one, remember w delta is a, is the, is the density profile. It's 
is a density profile, which roughly looks like this. And it also vanishes at r equal 1. OK, so this, in this sense, this operator is degenerate because it, it, it causes, it, it has these uh, vanishing uh, weights, if you wish, at, one, at 0 and at 1. Uh, this is not surprising. This is the type of difficulty you will see in, uh, in the study of, of just pure Euler. But it is suggestive. It tells you what sort of functional framework to use to, in fact, uh, uh, deal with this problem. It tells you that you need to use some type of weighted spaces. Um, now, the cool thing about this, if you pass to the self-similar time and you express, you now try to find the equation for phi, this is what you discover. So phi ss, the second derivative of phi, plus a strictly positive term times phi s, minus something negative times phi, plus this linearized operator equals the right-hand side, which is nonlinear. OK, and you immediately see, you realize what should be the mechanism for stability. It is precisely this blue term here, which acts as an effective damping. This is a consequence of the fact that we are expanding, uh, we are expanding our profile around an expanding solution. If I did it around a collapsing solution, the, the sign here would, be, would change, and this would be sort of the opposite of damping. OK, so it's a wave equation, quasi-linear wave equation on a compact domain, but with a disk damping term. So the correct statement is that there is a high order energy if it is initially sufficiently small, and if the energy of the physical energy of the in, in initially is exactly zero, then there is a glo global unique solution to the above equation, and in fact it decays exponentially fast in the s variable. In the t variable, this translates into some sort of algebraic decay. Uh, how the, the, the high order energy is, 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 is down to the Cauchy theory, I guess, right? Precisely. This is, this is what you need. This, this thing eats you the derivatives, right? Well, thank you for the question, because I will uh, now, in, in next slide, I will write down the energy. The, the L delta is a self-adjoint operator with respect to this weight. Remember, this vanishes at 1, this vanishes at 0. Spectral gap. OK, 1 is in the null space of this operator. So, so if, you're, if you're orthogonal to the, to the null space, you're good. You, you, you have a coercivity of this operator. Uh, this per se is, is obvious. What I do want, to pay, want you to pay attention to, this uh, first term is just the L2 norm in the corresponding weighted space. If you want to control the first derivative, you have to raise the, the level of degeneracy in the, the weight W delta. So every derivative gets worse. Correct. Correct. So this is a critical observation. Not, not the one uh, which are... Uh, no, it's only in this direction. Yeah, absolutely. Excuse me, the, the B you mentioned is... Uh, the, sorry, I forget. Is it constant? It's a constant. Okay. It's a constant. Uh, B is a constant due to the... because of the self-similar uh, structure. Yeah. Because I'm expanding around self-similar solution. Yeah. So it, it, really, it really captures that. This is the sort of the correct information about the self-similarity that you need to, to address this. Um, term is obviously the good guy, this term here. This is the bad guy. This will give you one, exactly one unstable mode. But this is uh, not surprising. I told you that it has to be unstable. Remember, the, the self-similar self uh, expansion was a co-dimension one uh, uh, phenomenon. So clearly, this has to be the case. But this unstable mode, which, which is caused by this, this negative term, um, is, um, well, remember, we are, we are starting with zero energy data. And so the, the unstable direction, you can check this, is transversal to this zero energy surface. So you can really control the, you can really control the, the, the instability, which translates in this case in controlling the, the inner product of phi and, uh, and, and the generator of the null space. So this allows you to, to carry, carry on the estimates. So think of this as, so this is the relationship that you get by linearizing energy equals zero. This is the quantity that you will control just by doing uh, some simple energy identity. And this is the quantity that you want to control to get the spectral gap. Now, answer to uh, Pierre's question. Indeed, the energy is motivated, uh, in, in this case, quite concretely, 
in the second case, more philosophically, in the case of linear expansion, by the works of uh, these people. And uh, now we come to, the ob to your observation. Indeed, uh, you, I don't want you to gain any intuition from this. All I want you to see is that each time I take a, a further normal derivative, I have to raise some index in my, in my, uh, in my weight. And this is, this is how this works. These, these delta k spaces are uh, basically mean you add k, uh, you add a k-fold power of w delta to, to, your, uh, to your weight. And this is the only way you can do it. So more spatial derivatives implies more degenerate weights. And now you will trust me if I tell you how the energy method works. You, um, you try to prove something like this. This term here kind of comes from that damping term that I mentioned. Of course, you need to control uh, the, the energy by this dissipative term here. You can do that because of the spectral gap uh, property. That, that it's, it's a technical thing, but you can do it. And this, in principle, gives you the exponential decay and completes the proof. What, uh, what uh, perhaps I want to say, going back one slide, this is a mixed space-time norm. In reality, you do the estimates only with the time vector field because it commutes with the equation entirely. And then you use elliptic estimate to, to, to control the higher uh, space derivatives with, with the time derivatives. Um, so this is what I just said. Use the, the time derivatives to build an energy, elliptic estimates. Now, what are the technical tools that go into closing the estimates? Remember, there is a nonlinear uh, right-hand side, which actually looks quite dirty when you write it down. So the tools are uh, hardy in inequalities, which exactly allow you to deal with those uh, weights that degenerated 0 and 1, and uh, imb embeddings between weighted Sobolev spaces. If you take enough derivatives, you can control lower norm by the energy, uh, L infinity norms by of lower order terms by the energy. So I will not go into any of this. This is, uh, this is technical. I will, I have um, eight minutes left. I will, okay, so let me then say just a few words about this second problem here and may try to hint at least at why is it more difficult than the first one. Uh, the difficulty appears not to be conceptual, but more, more technical. Uh, but it, it is there, and it took us some time to understand. So the reason why this problem is harder conceptually is because uh, you don't, uh, there is not, a, uh, you, you cannot, um, it doesn't honor the self-similar uh, structure of the problem. It doesn't honor the scaling invariances. The solutions are there, but how do you prove uh, that they are, they are stable? So uh, it will necessitate a use of a, of a... So first of all, the fact that it is not honoring the invariance will disallow us from using time vector fields. As you will see, they will not commute well with the, with the problem because now when I write down the equation for my perturbation phi, it will, it will have time-dependent coefficients, okay? Uh, so we have to come up with a correct uh, spatial derivative that will capture the, the degeneracies at the vacuum. And uh, this is precisely this vector field here, which just happens to be a, a five-dimensional Laplacian, but this is a coincidence. Okay, so what we do, we rescale time so that tau, the new time, becomes log t again. So this means dividing by this linearly expanding profile. Let me write it down. Okay, here. So lambda tilde of t, think of it as something that behaves like a constant times t. And if you write down the equation for the perturbation, now you discover that uh, you have these uh, tau dependent factors in front and lambda tilde is growing exponentially. In this, new, in this new variable. Okay, so you have e to the, let's say e to the tau plus e to the tau plus this stuff equals, uh, equals right inside. This is still causing a certain damping effect. The ex it is well known that the expansion uh, produces a sort of a stabilizing effect. Uh, it's reminiscent of, of works, for instance, in, in uh, special relativity, in the general relativity, when you have a cosmological constant, for instance. But and this is the statement, there is a high order, order energy E tilde that will allow you that for small, uh, that will give you global existence for small data. Uh, however, the, you cannot classify the asymptotic attractor. 
So, so all you can say is that the time derivative, the tau derivative of the solution decays, but you cannot say that in the limit you belong to a nearby member of the linearly expanding family. This energy is constructed by using powers of this elliptic operator that I just uh, wrote a second ago. And uh, um, so, uh, to be honest, I. To be honest, I, I, can, I can talk about it. There, I have a few more slides at the end, but let me, let me not go into the technical aspects of this proof. Let me just say that this operator is designed to capture uh, very precisely. So, uh, in other words, you cannot just blindly apply dr derivative or dx. If you do that, you will create singularities at zero, and they are hard to handle. So you have to do, do it with a particular combination. And this operator S is a reflection of the structure of that, of that weighted degenerate operator L delta. And let's leave it at that. So I will not go into the technical details. But what would be the asymptotic state? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, so it's just something that sits nearby. But it's not, it is not one of the... But you, but you have to identify in the proof, right? Yeah, yeah. It ex it well, you, all you, all you, you can prove that the time derivative of that is decaying. So that gives you convergence to something. Yeah, 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 and it's nearby. Yeah, it's actually reminiscent of a of a result I heard uh, recently in a talk by uh, by Volker, Volker Schluer, and it's sort of in these expanding space times. Who's here? I believe. Yeah, very good. Um, let me spend the remaining three minutes discussing perhaps questions that are that are I find very interesting that are that are open. So here's this kind of a silly lemma. Okay, I call it lemma. Perhaps too uh, it's too ambitious to call it lemma. Uh, do there exist collapsing or expanding s compactly supported stars? So this is the key uh, for other values of gamma. They should exist in the supercritical range, which is between six fifths and four thirds. This is a, a, an open question. What you can show, however, is that self-similarity and a spherical symmetry cannot coexist for this type of uh, collapse. Gamma being four thirds is absolutely critical for the two to be able to, to be able to combine the two. Okay, and this is a very silly thing to show. It's it's just some uh, it's just some um, conservation law type cal calculation. So the question is, can you construct axisymmetric? self-similar collapse in, the, in this mass supercritical range. Uh, I think this, this, um, this is a very interesting problem. Um, and now we come to the question that I believe uh, Sergio asked. Uh, are the lane emden stars that, are, that I mentioned before in the subcritical range, where they're shown to be conditionally stable, are they in fact stable? So a possible mechanism, and you will see this discussed sometimes in the physics literature, is uh, some type of shock formation. Uh, this is this is not known, and this is really uh, really important. So let me remind you of this picture. The big uh, the the pink elephant in, in the room is of course this region here, the collapsing region. So as I said, uh, it is it is not difficult to show that it's nonlinearly unstable. The moment you have a correct well positive theory. And you have a growing mode. It's it's not e it's very easy, but uh, so again, this should be a lemma. But it's really unsatisfactory because it doesn't tell you anything about the the, pro the real instability. In particular, it, could it be that that uh, the nearby guys uh, decay uh, collapse at perhaps a corrected rate? Do they collapse at all? So this is just in spherical symmetry. You don't have to go outside spherical symmetry to ask these these questions. And finally, I would, like to, um, uh, I would like to sort of point out this viewpoint that I, I believe studying this, this family of problems is really, uh, is really the right thing because you really want to understand, have a robust understanding of how equations of state affect the collapse. This is partly motivated by general relativity. If you think of the most famous example of a collapsing star in general relativity, it's the Oppenheimer-Snyder solution, which by a, which, which corresponds to the case where you don't have any pressure. So by a result of Christodoulou from 83, I believe, you can show that these are, these are generically, uh, these are unstable solutions. That generic, the, it, if you go outside the homogeneity class, you generically uh, form naked singularities. 
So you want to, you want to, well, you can, you can devise various conclusions out of that. Uh, one conclusion that I like to, to draw out of that is that studying uh, non-trivial equations of state is an important problem, and this is just the Newtonian version of the problem. But realistic equations of state are, this is uh, just a, a final comment, in, is in principle quite a hard problem, even for physicists. So this is my favorite uh, relativistic astrophysics book uh, by Zeldovich and Novikov, where I sort of learned this stuff about, and they discuss one of the sort of high density regimes for, for the, for the uh, equations of state. And here's what Zeldovich says. So it reminds him of Averchenko's uh, parody. So, it, 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 and it is precisely like this. So, if you look at the astrophysics literature, there is a there is a huge disparity between what people think is the right uh, equation of state. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. So, uh, this is a teaser. Think of it as a teaser trailer for this wonderful textbook because because uh, it's it's a very serious book. But as I browse through it, every every now and then I find a gem of this of this type. Uh, thank you. Any questions or comments? In case we need any. So, uh, so it, it seems, uh, since uh, the, the non-linear expanding rate is, is unstable, does it mean that basically we can start with solutions which will converge to the stable one, which is a linear one? Ah, okay. So if you if you generically perturb uh, a self-similar expanding rate. If you generically perturb it with perturbations that have positive energy, then they will converge to the linear guy. So it's generically unstable, and it, these guys are stable really only in the co-dimension one sense. So the linear is stable. The linear is the stable. The linear takes over, not the self-similar. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. So do the physicists know this fact? I mean, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. It should be of great interest to them, I guess. Right? I mean well, uh, uh, if you read. Uh, yeah, exactly. So if you read Goldreich and uh, Weber which uh, was one of the starting points for this project, they, uh, for some reason, they really say, we will not be interested in these, uh, in these linear rates. They drop a constant of integration in a second order ODE, which allows them to uh, go down one level and get an explicit solution, which is this. And they, they literally say, ah, we, we kind of don't want to look at that. Yeah. So, but this is, this is the finding. I mean, part of the mess was also to understand the exact structure of this, of this parameter space. Yes. Uh, unstable <laughs> result, the, the nonlinear unstable result covers the whole regime of gamma written there, or actually, it actually goes up to here. I did not tell you what happens at six fifths. At six fifths, you get a, you still get a, a, a steady state, but it is uh, supported all the way up to in, it's infinitely. It has an infinite support, and it turns out to be so. In this case, the steady state is exactly uh, the steady state of the critical uh, quintic wave equation. So it's one of these guys. I don't know, so there's some constant here, uh, and then I believe one over two, something like that. So this is the, this is the rate of decay of this guy. So it is the most complicated case to prove the most of it? In this work, well, it's, it's quite different, because here, here uh, you are working on a compactly supported domain, so you, you really have to rely on the well posedness theory for uh, vacuum interface problems. Here it's different. Here the weights are at infinity. So it has a flavor of it, but it's quite different. I'm not sure how to... How to so this result is also due, due to Jang. So this equality case, all of this is due to uh, Jang. In, sorry, in this range, I have to be careful. This is the instability range. What, what this uh, result shows, in a, in a way, is that the four-thirds case, which is linearly stable, is in fact widely unstable. Mm -hmm. uh, so the result is radial for the stability. It's ra it's, this is entirely radial. So the paper that will show up is, is entirely radial, but uh, um, it, it holds also for non-radial perturbations. So, yeah. it, it as I, so I, I sort of alluded earlier to that. There's a, there's a reason why 
uh, the radial case uh, is simpler, not just for obvious reasons, but also because it, it reduces the whole problem to just a quasi-linear wave equation. Uh, when, you have a, when, you, when, you work, uh, when you work with a non-radial case, so the fluid is not irrotational anymore in general, so you have to uh, account for the, for the vorticity which does not satisf has, have this wave-like wave structure, but it satisfies a certain transport equation that allows you to, to uh, control it. Well, what makes the vorticity better than in the standard Euler equation, where we know that you, you cannot control the vorticity? Is it because of the... Well, it's a local in time result. I mean... Uh, but no, but it, this is drawn in your topic. Yeah, yeah. So all I'm saying, I'm not sure if I understand your question, but all I'm saying is that... Ah, the long, uh, for the long, long time. For the long time result, you don't have a long time. Oh, if you haven't produced it yet, no, no. So for the irrotational case, it will be, it will be uh, straightforward. Yeah. And uh, for the vorticity in the, in the long time result, okay, I don't want to make the claim yet. Yeah. I don't think... Uh, because I don't see why it should be any better than... Than in the uh, regular case, yeah. Maybe. No, 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 you have this damping effect, so it will be better. It will be better. But will affect the vorticity? No, no. You have, for instance, for uh, for Friedman, Lemet, Robertson, Walker space times, you have uh, you have a stability without irrotational assumption. So when you have so when you have a cosmological constant, for instance, and you perturb away from that, you see this. Uh, you see you can control the full full flow. Of course, this is not a free boundary problem because this free boundary problem in GR is more. Okay, but the mechanism, the mechanism, will be simple. Yeah, yeah. You will kill it with damping. So we start again at uh, 11.30, so let's go.